Hello, everyone. Um, so today we're going to go over an article by the very famous Don Mabalon, and it's called American as Jack Rabbit Adobo. So let's share our screen and hopefully this works. All right. And let me get myself out. Yes. Okay. All right. So today we're going to go over an article or a chapter called as American as Jack Rabbit Adobo, Cooking, Eating, and Becoming Filipina, Filipinos, American, I guess they would call it now Filipino X, uh, Before War II by Don Mabalon. Today, I want you to pause the screen, and I want you to go on YouTube, and I want you, for the video opener, I want you to look, listen to the Little Manila Historic Type Dedication by Don Mabalon speech. It's a great speech. Um, so pause the screen. Go to the right so you can see who she is and what a wonderful scholar she is. And listen to that 10 minute speech or 12 minute speech and it's really wonderful. All right, so today's article is about Filipino food or I guess you could say Filipino X uh, if you're into that uh, new, I guess, writing style. Um, I guess to recognize that you wanna be genderless. So Don Buholan Alana uh, Ma Balan, uh, is a PhD. She uh, uh, was born in 1972, and she recently actually passed in 2018. She's an academic of Filipino history in Central Valley. Uh, she's born in Stockton. Her schooling was at San Joaquin Delta Community College, and I think she also went to UCLA with her MA on Filipina pioneers. Her PhD was also life in Little Manila, where she went to Stanford University a wonderful and great academic. Now, she actually co-founded uh, with Dillian uh, Devlo the Little Manila Foundation in order to preserve the Little Manila in Stockton, kind of like historical project. She actually also was a professor at San Francisco State University, and she was associate, so a history professor. Unfortunately, she uh, recently passed away in an accident in Hawaii. So she's actually quite famous because she's written so many books. She wrote Little Manila is in the Heart, uh, which is a wonderful history of Stockton. Um, she also wrote a children's book about the life of Larry Ilatongon and also Filipinos in Stockton. So she's a wonderful academic who's really done a lot of contribution to Asian American life. So her chapter is about her father, but her father is a historical person, just like your fathers are historical people. And she talks, she, one of the things about uh, uh, her is that she encourages Filipino Americans to preserve their family histories with a goal of expanding the historical narrative. Asian Americans and all ethnic groups should preserve their family histories and possibly donate them to archive. So she talks about how her father first comes to the United States. His name is Ernesto Mababalon, which is Don's father, and he arrives in 1963 to Stockton, California from the Philippines. Her Lolo, which is her grand grandfather, and, and it also runs the popular Filipino kind of uh, restaurant called Lafayette uh, Lunch Counter in Stockton in Little Manila. So the thing, the first thing he wanted to do when he came to the United States, her father, was he wanted to eat dried fish. He's like, oh, I want to eat dried fish. Because, you know, he grew up eating dried fish and rice and this like home to him. So then when we got to his um, restaurant, he cooked it and it stunk up the entire restaurant. And everyone started complaining, that the patrons. And then his father came in and complained, don't ever eat that or, or, or make that fried fish again. So he was very unhappy and he said to himself, he'll always eat that fried fish. Now, if we're in the classroom together, I would ask you, have you ever eaten food that others thought was stinky or strange? So the first uh, item that you see for you is durian, as they call it in Southeast Asia, the king of fruit. It has an extremely pungent smell and people often think that, um, it is very explosive. People say the flesh is a very fleshy, uh, uh, warm, kind of rustic uh, texture. Actually, recently at UC Davis, there was a, a student that ate this durian, and someone actually called the uh, 
the fire department and they said there was a bomb on campus for the smell. So yes, I think that those kind of a cultural miscue between uh, the student and someone else who's never smelled and ate those things before. The second picture you see is stinky tofu. This is a Taiwanese delicacy and it's overwhelmingly the smell is just, it actually is banned in Singapore and Taiwan and bringing it in the train station, you like literally the smell just, oh, I can't really describe it, uh, but people say it's delicious. <laughs> and the last item is balut. Balut is kind of like a semi-fertilized um, duck egg. You sort of like a cereal box. You just don't know what has been formed of the duck and what's not. I was laughing with my students because they're saying, yeah, Filipinos have a name for a balut, but actually lots of Southeast Asians eat it. <laughs> but they're like, let's give it to them. They, they can get the name. <laughs> That's really funny. But uh, yes, my Lao students, Hmong students, uh, Vietnamese students, they all eat balut. I, I don't know what, what the name is, but it's a common thing. Um, it's like, like a surprise in each box, or in this case, the shell. So he was chastised, Bob, uh, uh, Don's father was chastised, Ernesto, by his father. And he said, don't ever, ever make this like fried fish again. And so here you see it's a, it's a very common dish. It's kind of like fermented fried fish. But for Don's father, this toyo was actually like an important symbol of culture, class, and, and identity as a provinciano, which is a person of the provinces. So her father swore he'll always eat it despite these old timers who said, no, we're too good to eat this rice and fish. So before World War II, over 150,000 Filipinos immigrated to the USA uh, before w, uh, War II. And now they now were despising or very embarrassed about by their food of the youth, right? And so this like really got Dawn thinking like, what? She's a historian, so she's like, you mean you don't like like the food that you grew up with anymore because you're totally embarrassed? So then she said, well, there's got to be a transformation of food then. So her, as a historian, these are the questions she asked. So then what do Filipino people eat then if they're so embarrassed of this like, fermented uh, fish, right? And how did American colonialism transform the Filipino diets? Like, if that's the case, then why did they transform it? And then three, what role did gender and class play in the production and consumption of Filipino food. What recipe survived the journey and what was transformed? And how did the cannery or farming transform the way Filipinos cooked? So let's answer these questions. Well, Filipinos, they actually went to Chinese restaurants uh, for chop suey. Um, they kind of, they had it for like special events and there was like a lot, a pretty big sizable uh, Chinese population in the Philippines for a, like generations and so they're kind of familiar with Chinese food and so they went there for uh, birthday parties and just like oh I'm American I eat chop suey okay and Filipinos discarded they used they would eat and use discarded parts from butchers fishmongers grocers and they would make delicious meals okay like uh, fish head tripe bellies, um, tails, and of course they ate veggies, and they had canned uh, foods um, like corned beef and spam, and you know, they ate adobo. They had to eat adobo once a week, so that even though they don't have those official foods um, and even ingredients, they would adobize, you know, American foods. So the second question is, how did the cannery or farming transform the way they cooked, right? And after the war too, many Filipinos joined the army and transformed their food. So they had seal adobo, salmon singalog, singagag, and they adapted American ingredients. And now it is Filipino American food, right? Of course, there's no salmon in the Philippines, right? It's from Alaska. But there's lots of Filipinos who were like shipped to Alaska to work in, the, in those um, Alaska fisheries. And so they just transformed it. How, so another question is, how did Filipino colonial, how did American colonialism transform the Filipino diet? What, what recipe survived the journey and what was transformed? Well, un, fun fact or sort of sad 
Asian on Asian kind of, uh, cr you know, crime is the incarceration of Japanese Americans on the West Coast allowed Filipinos to take over their empty stores and farms and Filipino grocery stores kind of flourished. And of course, the adobo survived. So they transformed, they took over Japanese stores after they're incarcerated and the adobo, uh, they would just adoboize new items. So another question is, what role did gender and class play in the production and consumption? Well, it was mostly young Filipinos, there's no elders around, had to adapt to the newest ingredients in these new Americanized ingredients. So also another different way is, these are different Filipinos from different parts of the Philippines. They all had different cuisines. Some had coconut, some had more seafood. And when they came together, they fused all the different Filipino, you know, different uh, islands. Uh, Philippines is like many thousand islands. And it became like Filipino American foods. And Don talks about how, in terms of class, it was mostly poor Filipinos who came to the U.S. So they mostly ate fish and rice. They never were like beef, steak eating people. They wouldn't have come to the United States if, uh, if they were eating that. So again, uh, Don just makes a great contribution in talking about how Filipinos were cooking, eating, and becoming Filipino American by eating these different foods. And so the last thing that she talks about, last slide, is the total differences, but also similarities and transformations of Filipino American food. They still ate rice, they adoboized. Adobo is kind of like a barbecue. They had barbecued things that they just didn't, they usually have adobo chicken or adobo pork, but they didn't have that. So they had adobo bear, they had adobo jack rabbit, they had adobo um, just, you know, salmon, just un un unusual items that they don't have in the Philippines, but they adoboized them. They ate lots of vegetables. They thought American food was more hygienic. They made these things like chiffon cake. They ate biscuits. They did kind of illegal um, salmon fishing and they dried it later and they would doublize it. And just really interesting things like bear, like they ate bear, <laughs> which of course is not in the Philippines. And we talked about how they ate chop suey, which is to be more Americanized. And they used animal parts that butchers discarded. And one of the things that's well loved in Filipino culture is, of course, canned corned beef, hot dogs, and spam. So yeah, Filipinos really transformed. Filipino American food tr transformed by coming to the United States. So that's the last slide. If you guys have any questions, uh, uh, please email me at, at mail.fresnostate.edu. And thank you so much. And I'll see you for the next slide, the next meeting.